general theme of, of, uh, of this summer slash winter school um, than any other other talk. I'm not really a photonics person, right? Not a photonics person at all, I should say. And I'm a catalysis person, right? I I do interface with people who are in in general in the photonics um, area because we're interested in things like using light to provide the energy to do reactions. And so I'll talk about that eventually, but I'll start with some introductory um, material that just talks about where catalysis plays a role in energy applications in general, really focused on renewable and sustainable energy applications. Right? And this will, will um, especially the, the second half of my presentation, so the last two, will be very focused sort of on water splitting chemistry and its reverse oxygen reduction chemistry. But the first half will be more general, though we'll see some of that water chemistry uh, creeping in early on. Okay, so uh, maybe to get started, I'll ask you guys a question. All right, so can anybody define what a catalyst is for me? Just a general chemistry definition is fine. Yeah. Uh, compound that boosts the reaction, but it's not used in the reaction. Oh, perfect. So you have almost exactly what I have up here. All right. So it's a it's something, some substance, and right? it can be a variety of different substances. We'll talk mainly in here about solid materials, um, so synthetic materials. But we could be dealing with enzymes, acids in solution, bases in solution, polymers can be catalysts. But it's just something that speeds up the rate of reaction without itself being consumed by the reaction. And so the way that this is shown classically, so maybe in a pre-college chemistry type class, right, is that you have some energy difference between reactants and products. Right? So X is our reactant and Y is our product. And in this case, we have an endothermic reaction, so it's energetically uphill. Right? And we also have a barrier between, an energy barrier between reactants and products. And the way catalysts generally work is to lower that barrier. Right, but this is not really that great of a description. I never really understood this when I took chemistry in pre-college, what this really meant, so reaction path, energy. Right? And so really what a catalyst does is a lot more complicated than that. And to really explore what a catalyst does, it's useful to look at a specific example. Right, so this is a plot taken from Gerhard Erdl's um, Nobel Prize acceptance speech from 2007. Um, he spent a lot of his career looking at this reaction. So it's like a pretty simple one. So you're taking nitrogen that comes out of the air and hydrogenating it to make ammonia. And then from ammonia, you, make, you can make a lot of other compounds. Uh, this was originally commercialized um, in Germany and around, started around 1910, say, and it was originally used to make quite a bit of explosives um, as being downstream products from ammonia. Right, but its growth, its use really grew, as you can see in the time period from the 40s to the 80s, when it was used in fertilizers. And so, and it still is used in fertilizers. And so adding nitrogen to the soil is one of the best things that you can do to improve productivity. And so Errol showed this plot that shows how population, world population was able to explode. And a lot of people attribute this directly to the ammonia synthesis process. Um, and ammonia synthesis, when it was invented, it resulted in the awarding of two Nobel Prizes, actually. Um, so um, Fritz Haber um, won a Nobel Prize for sort of discovering the catalyst that does this, and Carl Bosch won the Nobel Prize um, a couple of decades later, actually, for, for being able to design the kinds of reactors that would be able to conduct this, this sort of chemistry, um, which required being able to operate at very high pressures that were not um, used before in the industry. <coughs> And so if you look at this reaction, this is actually a reaction that also occurs, for example, in, in cyanobacteria, which provide nitrogen to plants so that they can grow. So cyanobacteria are in the, the soil, right? and they do this reaction, and plants can grow based on the nitrogen that's in the soil since they need, in order to grow, to incorporate that nitrogen, right? which is originally in the air. And so if we didn't have a catalyst, there's no way that this could occur, because what, we're, what we have to do ultimately for this reaction to take place is that for this nitrogen molecule that we're feeding, we have to break that nitrogen-nitrogen bond. And that's an, actually a triple bond between those two nitrogen atoms. So it's very difficult to break and you'd have to pull it up, um, supply lots and lots of energy to split that into two nitrogen atoms to subsequently react. We have to do the same thing with diatomic hydrogen. And we have to do that three times. Right, and so what a catalyst does is it lets us 
do this without such a large energy penalty. So it provides a way of balancing that energy that we need to split the bond um, in a way that makes it more energetically feasible. Okay, and so here's the reaction again. And this has been studied in detail on the, the kinds of catalysts that are actually used in industry, which typically are iron-based or ruthenium-based catalysts. So transition metal catalysts that are supported on an, a ceramic support such as aluminum. We'll talk about why they, they're made up of that kind of composition in a few minutes, but um, I don't think it's too important to go into the details of every single step here, but what's basically been shown now is that the, the way this reaction happens is that the nitrogen molecule comes in and, and undergoes a dissociation barrier um, to form adsorbed nitrogen atoms on the surface of a catalyst. And so the reaction process is basically that N2 comes in and splits on the surface of the catalyst. And the reason it can do this a lot more readily than it can just in the gas phase, for example, is that the nitrogen is forming bonds with the surface. So with, in this case, the ruthenium atoms on the surface. Which, and those bonds give the molecule energy, or allow the molecule to dissipate the energy, rather, of splitting that nitrogen-nitrogen bond. And so that's what the catalyst really does for us. It also dissociates hydrogen for us, and then you get sequential addition of nitrogen and hydrogen. All right, I mentioned that this is also um, a reaction that occurs in plants, right? So there's also an enzyme catalyzed reaction. This shows the case of a surface catalyzed reaction. Um, I guess I, this is where I get in trouble for having animation. I forget what's on my next click. All right, but what's, what these researchers were really able to show is that essentially, and we'll get back to this point later, um, that essentially all of the reaction takes place on particular types of atoms on clusters of the metal. And so this is what a ruthenium metal particle looks like, where we show the individual atoms. This shows a, a TEM image of, of an example particle. And they've been able to figure out using mainly um, quantum chemical methods that the reactions all occur on step sites. And as we'll talk about, the reason for that is that these atoms are not as coordinated as the atoms in the more cleaner regions. And so they're more willing to form new bonds with the nitrogen that comes into the surface. All right, but so this is the way the reaction basically goes on, on the solid materials used in industry. All right, which, which catalyst do you think would be more efficient, the enzyme catalyst or the, the solid supported catalyst? So maybe we'll, we'll take a vote. So how many people vote for the industrial catalyst as being more efficient? All right, what about the enzyme catalyst? Lots of people abstaining, but generally it looks like the majority votes for the uh, enzyme catalyst. That's not exactly a fair comparison because they're not competing on the same basis. The actual turnover frequency, so the, the rate with which catalytic sites catalyze individual sites, let's say an individual atom here versus an individual enzyme binding pocket, right, catalyze this reaction is actually faster in the industrial case. But the reason for that it is that we're able to use the industrial catalyst at 300 degrees Celsius, which is close to the operating condition of the reactor. And so that greatly speeds up the reaction. We can't use enzymes under those conditions because, of course, they'll, they'll unfold and be destroyed um, and, and lose their innate activity. And so one of the big advantages to developing these kinds of catalysts is that they're very robust um, so that we can operate them at very high temperatures. And we'll look at some processes that involve tem uh, temperatures as high as 1,000 degrees Celsius, for example. Any, any questions so far? <coughs> okay, so we just looked at one example of catalysis that's um, probably the most studied catalytic reaction. This one's definitely high on the list, probably in the top five of ones that are studied. Right, this is the, this reaction here, taking ethylene to ethylene oxide, is the greatest value producing reaction in the chemical industry. Right, so you're adding an oxygen atom to form an, an epoxide, and then this is a very hazardous chemical um, that actually a lot of the um, tragic industrial accidents in the chemical industry have, have involved this molecule. Um, it's, it's very poisonous, but it's still produced in very large volumes. And so they take this straight away to make ethylene glycol, which of course is important in a lot of polymers, um, but is also um, the main component of anti Okay, and so in this reaction, sort of what the catalyst needs to do is maybe a little bit more complex than in the ammonia synthesis case. All right, and that represents the challenge of selectivity. Whenever you try to add oxygen to an organic molecule, 
you're always going to have a competing reaction where you produce CO2 and water, which of course are very unvaluable products. And so you want to try to control the selectivity. And so we, and that really the selectivity of going down this route is what completely drives efforts to improve um, the catalyst. Whereas in the ammonia synthesis case, we're always trying to improve the rate with which that nitrogen-nitrogen bond splits because we don't really have a competing pathway that produces a non-selective product. All right, so in this case, what, what um, researchers have been able to do recently is understand the detailed mechanistic processes, and we'll, we'll talk about um, in general how people try to do this, that involve formation of the desired product, ethylene oxide, and the undesired product, carbon dioxide. And so then they can do something like screen a variety of catalyst compositions, of surface compositions, and look for one that stabilizes the desired transition state um, compared to the undesired transition state in order to try to design better catalysts. All right, and so in this case, we have a real selectivity-driven design, not an activity-driven design. But those are the two basic considerations in surface catalysts. Okay, so I've, I've already talked, I wanted to start by jumping in and talking a little bit about what catalysis is and what the general issues are. Um, but now I'll go into a bit of an outline of, of what we'll talk about over the next few sessions. Um, of course, all energy is on Earth ultimately comes from sunlight. Right? And we'll be looking at, at the ways in which sunlight is um, transferred into different energy carriers. So we're interested primarily in what I'll be talking about in producing fuels. And so obviously throughout the session you'll hear other talks um, that will deal with related materials in which the interest is in producing electricity. Uh, but we'll talk mainly about both liquid fuels and hydrogen fuels during my um, sessions here. And so, of course, the current energy economy and the one that will be in place for, for quite a while, um, unfortunately, is, is based on fossil fuels. And those were ultimately produced from the sun. Right, and so basically the sun helped to grow crops, and then if you wait a couple million years, then you can um, form coal and oil, and then utilize that um, as an energy carrier. Right? A lot of the research that, that we do in my group is directed toward not waiting as long, and so using the sunlight to grow crops, and then trying to convert those directly into um, gasoline, for example, or other fuels, diesel fuels, or in fact hydrogen which can go in to run a hydrogen fuel cell. All right, and then if you're really impatient, um, and the ultimate way that I think everything will go, right, is that you want to um, produce fuels continuously from sunlight and not wait for a growing season. Right? And, and so you'll use photovoltaics um, integrated with catalysts in order to produce um, directly from solar energy, hydrogen for fuel cells, for example, or as we'll talk about later on, um, hydrocarbon fuels okay, from CO2 and water. Okay, so, so basically a, a synthetic photosynthesis in going this direction. Right, and so we'll start, you know, we'll talk about for most of this first session, and we've already started talking about our, we've talked about a couple of more traditional chemical and petroleum industry examples. Um, and we'll talk about at least one more and talk about some general concepts that have largely been developed and trying to develop and trying to um, develop catalysts for these kinds of applications, so producing um, gasoline and, and diesel and chemicals from, uh, from, from traditional fossil sources. Um, in the second session, we'll talk mostly about this, these routes, so taking sunlight to plants, and then we'll especially talk about um, how you can refine plants into fuels and, and, um, or into hydrocarbon fuels, and, as well as hydrogen. All right, and then the next two sessions we'll kind of focus on this general piece. So we'll talk both about the reactions that go on inside hydrogen fuel cells, for example, and other types of fuel cells. And then these reactions are actually very closely related to water splitting reactions. They're just the reverse of the water splitting reaction. Um, and, and so we'll show how this leads into understanding reactions that can produce, for example, hydrogen from water or hydrocarbon fuels from carbon dioxide. Any, any questions about this overview picture? Okay, and the other thing, so hopefully this shows how everything is connected as far as these different energy applications that we'll be talking about here. But what I also hope that I, I showed throughout these sessions 
is that a lot of the technologies, as far as catalysts anyway, are very closely connected. Right? So we're going to be seeing the same kinds of surface processes showing up in all of these applications. And I think, maybe in the interest of time, we'll talk about each of these um, as we hit the, the topics. And so maybe I'll mention these quickly for um, this session's topic. We're going to try to talk about what heterogeneous solid catalysts look like, um, how they work, which we've already talked about a little bit, um, how our studies of the elementary reactions conducted, we've already shown some of those elementary reactions, and then how can we use that knowledge to, to design better catalysts. And then, as I mentioned, topic two will deal with um, largely biofuels. Topic three will talk mainly about the electrocatalytic aspect of um, fuel cells and photoelectrochemical cells. And then in the, the fourth session, we'll talk mainly about photoelectrochemistry, so the integration of electrochemistry and photochemistry. OK, and as we go through these sessions, right, it's important to point out that this area of uh, petroleum refining has received you know, at least a century of really in-depth research that's been financed heavily by um, very rich industries. Um, Biomass um, refining is more closely related to this, and so there's a little bit more known about it, but it's more complex for reasons we'll talk about when we get to that. And when we add in um, electrocatalysis, things get more complex still. And then, of course, the most complex case, and the case that's received that we study, are photoelectrocatalytic systems. So I, I show this existing knowledge decreasing. I, should, I could also put my knowledge here. All right, then maybe actually I would get a peak here. We do a lot of work in electrocatalysis, and we're really just starting um, to get into adding the photo to the electrocatalysis, although I know something about the area that I'll, I'll try to tell you about. Um, but certainly, I wouldn't be surprised if, if some people in this room certainly know more about the photo part of the catalysis than I do. OK, so what is a, a heterogeneous catalyst? Right, heterogeneous, that word comes from the phase that the catalyst is in. So it's in a different phase from the reactants. And so for a gas phase reactant, then that could in principle be a liquid phase catalyst. But that's almost never the case. All right, so you, whenever we talk about heterogeneous catalysts, we really typically mean solid catalysts that are used in reactions of vapor phase or liquid phase compounds. All right, so you can just read heterogeneous catalyst to mean um, solid catalyst. Right, and these solid catalysts, you know, although I mentioned there are many different types of catalysts, um, including liquid phase compounds, enzymes, etc., these kinds of catalysts we'll be talking about today are used in, for 90% of chemical reactions in the fuels industry currently. Right, so they're by far the most used, and they especially are advantageous for very large volume processes, so light production of fuels. For specialty chemical markets, you can afford to use other kinds of um, catalysts like enzymes and um, organic compounds. All right, and so this, this shows the most common type of solid catalyst, and that is a metal, this is several different images, maybe this is the best one, highest resolution, um, which basically are metal particles that are supported on ceramic metal oxide supports. So those are the most commonly used types of solid catalysts, and the Ceramic support is generally, though not always, just a catalyst carrier. Right? So it's all the real action, for the most part, is taking place on the metal. Again, usually, that's not always the case. Um, and this catalyst just carries the metal. Right? And the supports, maybe this image shows the best, are typically highly porous supports. Any, any idea why you would want a very highly porous support? Yeah. Higher surface or bigger surface? That's right, so you want a very high surface area per volume ratio. So you want to try to make your catalyst take up the least space possible, and you'll get more catalytic active sites the higher the surface area, since the reactions are actually occurring on the surface. Right, and the other advantage to, to trying to get high surface area is that a lot of times, this is an example of silver, which isn't all that expensive, actually, um, but when you use metals like platinum and rhodium that are extremely expensive, then you want to try to maximize the surface area of those materials. Um, and that's a huge issue in the, the types of fuel cells and, and solar cells that we'll talk about for um, production and use of fuel um, in a couple of sessions here. OK, 
Okay, the other main type of solid catalyst, and again, I, I, uh, there are all kinds of variants, but I'm talking about the, I'll talk about the main types in here, right, are oxide um, catalysts that are based on metal oxides, um, or um, a, a particular type of metal oxide catalyst is, is particularly important. That's a zeolite catalyst, which is a silica aluminate type catalyst. And then the images that I show here are silica aluminates, um, are zeolite catalysts. These are actually defined by um, a perfect crystalline structure with pores that are, can be of a tailored size. And the reaction generally occurs um, close to the aluminum sites in these zeolite frameworks. So the aluminum, which is the, the gray, the aluminum and silicon are the gray atoms inside the zeolite framework. Whenever you add in aluminum, that um, since aluminum is plus three compared to plus four for silicon, then it generates a, a vacancy that you can use to do catalysis. We'll, we'll talk about some examples that use these types of oxide catalysts. Okay, so what, what is the reason why heterogeneous catalysts are, are used predominantly in industry? Any, any idea? Why, why do you use solid catalysts as, a, as opposed to, say, an organometallic complex? It's easier to separate from the product. That's right, so that is by far the biggest reason. All right, so um, you, you'd like to be able to have, if you're, especially if you're processing lots and lots of stuff, you want a catalyst that it's easy to use over and over again and not have to separate out. And so by having the catalyst in a completely different phase from the reagents, then we avoid the separation costs, which in a lot of processes, separation costs are 90% of the process cost. So things like distillation columns are very expensive and use up a lot of energy by the way. Okay, another advantage that we already alluded to are the these catalysts can have issues with thermal stability for sure, but tend to be more thermally stable than a lot of their competitors. And so you can take advantage of the fact that reactions go a lot faster at higher temperatures generally. Um, and so these are very widely used in, in, in industry um, because they, maybe a bullet point that I should have here is, is also that um, they're very amenable to scale up. So to use this kind of catalyst, you can basically um, load a, a lot of the solid catalyst into a pipe, so it's called a packed bed reactor, and then just flow the fluid through it while you maintain the catalyst in the pipe. And that's a, a process that can be scaled up to producing you know, billions of gallons of product um, per year. So it's, it's, um, these catalysts are typically easy to scale up. Okay, what do you think is the biggest problem with using heterogeneous catalysts? What, what's a disadvantage that might cause you to use an enzyme, for example? Any ideas? So there are several answers. Yeah? They might be very expensive. Yeah, so they, they certainly can be pretty expensive. You can use expensive raw materials like platinum. And again, we'll talk about how you try to minimize those, but that's that's definitely an issue. Oxidation. I'm sorry? Oxidation. Still couldn't hear. Oxidation. Oxidation. So, um, so oxidation can be a problem. Probably even more of a problem that relates to this is just general poisoning. All right, so that can be through oxidation of the catalyst. It can be through very commonly sulfidation of the catalyst or coking of the catalyst by deposition of carbon. And we'll talk about those issues um, during this session. And any other issues? Yeah. And yeah, maybe they're hard to mix when they're in the same place. That's but right. So it, 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 sometimes mass transfer limitations can be an issue. So actually getting good mixing can be an issue. Although that's because of their wide use, that's largely a solved problem, I would say. Any, anything else? That, so, so maybe the big clue is in this name, heterogeneous. Okay, and so a lot of the problems of heterogeneous catalysts come down to their heterogeneity. And it's heterogeneity in a different sense than the definition of a heterogeneous catalyst. It's not because they're in a different phase necessarily. But these catalysts tend not to have a single type of catalytically active site. All right, so when you deposit metal um, crystallites onto an oxide support carrier. You get a lot of different sizes of crystallites typically. Um, the crystallites themselves have lots of different sites. We already saw that. They have um, planar type sites, they have steps, they have um, sort of point defects in them. Right? And so each of these different types of sites can do reactions in a different way. And this makes it very difficult to design sort of a molecular catalyst that always does the same reaction in the same way because you have this heterogeneity of the, the solid catalysts. And so this problem leads to other problems, 
right? And, and the biggest one is selectivity because we don't have outstanding control generally over the, the expression of catalytic sites on the surfaces um, that, that we use in, in the catalysis. And so a, a lot of the research, and we'll see some of this, that's going on now is trying to use um, nanostructuring techniques in order to make really make heterogeneous catalysts that have, the, have a well-controlled molecular character that every catalytic site looks the same. And that's really what's going to be necessary if you're going to try to go for the, the sorts of selectivities that are possible with enzyme catalysts, for example. A, a, another problem with heterogeneity is it makes it very difficult to do fundamental studies of how these catalysts work, because there are lots of different sites that can be involved. And so you have to try to probe either some average of those sites or you have to, to um, try to probe individual sites. And we'll, we'll kind of look at each of those sorts of strategies. Um, and in addition to that, we have, um, can have difficulties in, in um, doing mechanistic studies and interfaces, but sometimes that's more difficult than if you're doing it in a, a bulk solution type phase, right, in order to really see what's happening in the interface. Um, and then this sort of ties into the heterogeneity. It can be different labs can often produce nominally the same catalyst that behave very differently because of the high sensitivity to the different types of sites that are generated. And so reproducibly synthesizing the exact same catalyst can sometimes be an issue. And there are many, many patents dealing with vagaries of trying to, um, to synthesize the same catalyst every time. Any, any questions at this point? Okay, so um, I don't want to spend too much time on uh, these larger process diagrams. Uh, maybe I'll go ahead and skip to this huge one. <laughs> so that this will make everybody's eyes glaze over. Uh, but the point here is that for almost every box that you have here, all right, so catalytic cracking, for example, uses a zeolite catalyte, catalyst, excuse me. Um, I can barely even read this writing. So I think, is this, so there's catalytic hydrocracking, which uses a supported metal catalyst. Um, Hydrodesulfurization uses a supported metal catalyst that actually turns into a metal sulfide um, during the reaction in that catalyzes it. Um, alkylation is a metal oxide catalyst generally. Catalytic reforming is a supported metal. And so basically every box that we have here, the point is that takes as the input crude oil, and then you separate it into its different fractions and try to upgrade it and go into all the products that you make from crude oil. Just about every box in here uses a solid catalyst. Um, and so um, you need these catalysts to make the reaction go, and you also need to not worry about having to separate them. And you need them to be thermally stable because a lot of these reactions really go at high temperatures. And so solid catalysts are used throughout um, petroleum refineries. And we'll look at an example of a couple of these reactions pulled out of here instead of in this, this giant flow diagram. Okay, and so there are a couple of ways of trying to understand how solid catalysts work to, um, to do what they do and hopefully in, to use that understanding to improve them. And the way that's been used by far the most commonly is sort of an empirical approach. This is actually also taken from, this figure is also taken from Erdogan's uh, Nobel acceptance speech, um, where you basically use a smaller version of the kind of reactor that would be used in industry. So you pack a very small tube with catalyst, and you feed in the reactants, and you measure the products, and you change various variables in order to see how quickly various products are formed. Right? So you can change the nature of the catalyst, we can operate at different temperatures, we can change the partial pressures if it's a vapor phase, with the concentrations if it's a liquid phase, of the different components that are coming in, and then we can measure what the rate of reaction is, the rate of change of moles of the product, for example. Right, and so we can, from looking at those variables, we can kind of come up with a, a rough mechanism some for, sometimes for how reactions occur on the surface. Right, so based on the fact that one reactant, for example, really changing its pressure really changes the rate versus another reactant doesn't change it much, you can make certain postulates that are you know, on an indirect basis about how the catalyst really works, what the important things are that are happening. Um, I'm not going to go, that may not be too clear from that sort of hand wavy description, um, but since we have limited time, I, I don't really want to talk about this approach much um, because I want to focus on more, on more direct methods for really observing what's happening on catalyst surfaces rather than the indirect methods that have been more traditionally used. All right, so 
the more direct methods require approximations. Um, and so they require that you typically not use the actual catalytic materials that are used in industry, but that you, for example, use a single crystal surface. So a model material where you know exactly what you have and you don't have this um, large number of potential active sites that are poorly characterized. And so the first approximation that's generally made in doing true mechanistic studies of, of surface reactions um, is called the, the materials approximation. All right, so we assume that we can look at a model surface that shows a silver 110 model surface, just like I have something to point at. Um, but um, so we use a, a model surface, and the benefit that we get out of that is that we, there are a lot, um, it's a model study, so there are a lot few, fewer unknowns. Right, so we know what the catalyst looks like. And the disadvantage is that now we're stepping away from the actual material that's used in application. And we'll try to talk about if there's time, efforts that are used to try to extrapolate back once you understand the picture on these kind of model materials. So this is the first approximation. It's typically made in a lot of the studies we're going to look at. All right, the second approximation is the uh, sometimes called the pressure approximation or results in what can be called a pressure gap. Um, but really it's that you're changing also the conditions. So you're not necessarily operating under reaction conditions where um, species on catalysts tend to be very short-lived, so they can be very difficult to observe them. Um, but instead you're operating under conditions where you can isolate reaction intermediates, and so that typically involves operating at low temperature and low pressure, um, where the, the low pressure allows you to keep both a very pristine surface in order to do the reaction, um, and also allows you to use a variety of spectroscopic techniques that involve firing electrons at the surface. Um, that would be difficult to do at higher pressure, although now we're starting to be able to do some of that. Um, and so this is sort of an embarrassingly old system I showed here. Um, I kind of chose it because I like this diagram to the right. This is probably a 30-year-old vacuum uh, system for surface analysis. And many of you may use surface analysis in your own research and use techniques that are not all that different from the techniques that we would use to study surface reactions. So for example, we might use um, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy um, that a number of people might use, um, temperature program desorption, low energy electron diffraction. Um, we use a number of synchrotron techniques, um, X-ray absorption <coughs> final structure, for example, in order to see what's happening on the surface of the universe. And the way that, that you do these experiments in, in principle is quite simple, that we can just take a dosing needle with a valve attached to it and send our reactants into our sample, generally at low temperature, so that we absorb our intermediates on the surface before they have a chance to react. And then we'll, grad we'll rotate the sample in front of a technique, so let's say a mass spec to see the volatile products that are coming off, and we'll watch as we increase the temperature to see how the surface changes or what kinds of products come off um, in order to understand what kind of chemistry is happening. And we'll see a number of examples of, of the application of these techniques but that's really all that's going on typically is absorbing different types of compounds onto a surface and then using a variety of techniques to see what happens to those materials as they react. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk some more about the, the reaction that we, we first, um, or the second reaction we looked at, I guess, to, to show how this, some examples of how this works. This is actually, these are slides that are taken directly from my, uh, my PhD thesis. Um, so I took something from quite a while ago now. Um, and so the, um, this reaction occurs on a, a supported silver catalyst, but we're gonna make a materials approximation and use the silver 110 single crystal surface to try to study the reaction um, under ultra high vacuum. Um, the catalyst is heavily promoted, but I don't think, so it's not just silver, but I don't think we'll get into that today. Um, and and um, so we really, this reaction was first developed, this catalyst was first developed in the 1930s, but the mechanism still wasn't understood when I started to work on this in 1998 or so. Um, and so we actually turned to a different chemistry to try to, that's related, to try to understand how this chemistry works. So just taking butadiene instead of ethylene and epoxidizing one of the other ones. All right, so as I mentioned, the way that you do these kinds of studies is, is pretty simple in principle. So we just take, in this case, we took the product state for the experiments that I'm going to show here. So we just took epoxy butene, and we put it down on the surface at, say, 120 Kelvin or so. 
um, in an initial experiment. And then we just heated the surface up and we used a mass spectrometer to see what came off. And it was pretty boring when we did this dose at 120 Kelvin. It was just the product, epoxybutene, just came back off in a couple of different peaks. This peak corresponds to a monolayer of the adsorbed epoxybutene. So it's the state that actually is sitting on the surface and can potentially react, although it didn't in this case. Right? And then this corresponds to multi-layers of a liquid-like epoxybutene state that were condensed on the surface above the monolayer. Okay. So, but that's not very interesting. You see just a little tiny bump out here that I probably would have attributed to noise, right? except that when we do the dose at room temperature, we get different stuff happening. And so the first thing that we see is that now epoxybutene, a lot of it comes off, even though it, there's no real reaction, a lot of it comes off at very high temperature. So before, this process was complete by 250 Kelvin. Now it's coming off at closer to 500 Kelvin. So a real difference in chemistry by absorbing at higher temperature, which seems weird. And the other thing that we see is that we get about a 20% yield of another product, which is 2,5-dihydrofuran, which is an isomer of epoxybutene, so it has the same number of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms, but it's just arranged in a different way, in a more thermodynamically stable, less ring strain form. Right? So something about doing the reaction at high temperature, or doing the absorption at high temperature, right, led to observing a new reaction product. And we wanted to try to understand what that was. And so to really understand that, then you, you need to actually use surface sensitive techniques. And, and my group, a, a primary method we use is vibrational spectroscopy. Uh, this happens to be electron energy loss spectroscopy, but we also use infrared. And the, the selection rules are pretty similar between electron energy loss spectroscopy and infrared spectroscopy. Um, and so we can absorb epoxybutene on, our, on the surface at various temperatures. And here I'm just showing, excuse me, just showing the room temperature, um, the spectrum that we collected after a room temperature absorption. And these different peaks just correspond to different stretching motions of the molecule that we've isolated on the surface. Right now, nobody had ever studied this kind of surface intermediate before, so we didn't know exactly what we had. And so one tool that you'll see in a lot of the slides that I show over the next few days that is used very commonly in our field um, is density functional theory based quantum mechanical calculation where we, in addition to doing experiments, we try to determine um, both um, stable states, so stable absorbed intermediates and transition states using quantum chemical methods. And when we did basically a simulated experiment and put epoxybutene above a silver 110 surface and actually gave it a little bit of energy, then we saw that we got a ring opening reaction where before there was a bond between this carbon and this oxygen, it actually splits open. Um, and this is predicted to be very highly stable intermediate on the surface. We can use quantum mechanics to predict what the vibrational spectrum should look like, and it looks like what's shown here in red. And so you can see that there in general is very good agreement between the most intense um, stretching modes between theory and experiment, and we can compare a variety of other models, and they're not even close. All right, so using this kind of technique, we can look at a variety of, of surface intermediates and identify them. Right, the other type of spectroscopy that we'll, we'll see a number of results from is more um, sort of an electron excitation type spectroscopy. So for example, XPS, um, this is um, NEXAF, so near edge x-ray absorption fine structure. It was conducted at, at Brookhaven National Labs in the US. Um, also known as Zanes um, by some people. And so we can look at basically the, um, this gives us a, picture of the electronic structure of the adsorbate in terms of the energies of the unoccupied orbitals. Right? And so we can see that um, there are modes that we pick up in NEXAFs um, that correspond to the highest or the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital and then a little bit more excited orbital up here. And they show up more in the glancing incidence spectra than in the um, normal incidence spectra. And that tends to mean that those orbitals are aligned roughly perpendicular to the surface. And so we can again use density functional theory and find two states that are separated by 7 eV, just like in the experiment, that involve um, excited state orbital, orbitals that are roughly perpendicular to the surface. And so there are a lot of other techniques like this, and um, I um, will see some examples, but I just wanted to point out for this one chemistry, um, typical techniques that would be used in order to characterize and prove that you have a certain kind of surface energy on the, surface, 
underserves. Okay, I think I'll do this slide um, and we'll, we'll take a break. Um, and the, um, so one of the, this is actually more work from the Erdel group, the guy who won the Nobel Prize in, in 2007. Um, and so this is part of the work that he won the Nobel Prize for. Right, and, and one thing that I mentioned I want to talk about is trying to bridge the gap between the materials assumptions and reality and the pressure conditions assumptions and reality. And one of the things that Ariel showed was that a lot of times what we think of as a pressure gap is actually a materials gap. And so he looked at the problem that this seemingly very simple reaction, the oxidation of carbon monoxide to CO2, which is one that we'll look at when we get to the fuel cells, um, is a very fast reaction on ruthenium under atmospheric pressure conditions but it's a very slow reaction under low pressure conditions in which this reaction was studied in fundamental studies. And he showed that the problem actually wasn't that it was a pressure gap, so there's nothing fundamental about the fact that you were operating at low pressure that caused this seeming difference in, um, in the catalytic activity, but it was actually that the difference in pressure was causing a materials gap. And so um, somebody brought up the idea that the catalyst can be oxidized. It turns out that um, with ruthenium, you need to raise the pressure up to the um, Tor level in order to see a surface oxidation process take place. Right, so this shows what the an STM, what the surface looks like um, that's unoxidized. And then when you expose it to oxygen in a few Tor, you form a surface that looks very different They're using DFT calculations that show looks like this, that you actually are starting to add oxygen to the surface, top surface of the ruthenium um, to form a surface oxide. And they actually show that it's this oxide that's the active catalyst for CO oxidation. And that it's active even under very low pressure conditions if you just create that material by, by increasing the pressure and then you can lower the pressure and have the oxide there. It's a very good catalyst. Right? But this, um, this pressure difference led to a materials gap right, in the performance of the material. Okay, I think we have, I have maybe just three slides left in this session, but I think it's, it's now, excuse me, as good a point to stop at as, as any, and so we can, we can stop now and take our break and, and pick up um, from here. Thank you.